any change on the railroads, you know, has to come from workers, you know, and the fact that these guys, you know, I mean, they're overwhelmingly men, you know, are divided into like 14 different unions. is just like totally fucking insane. And really is like why there isn't a national conversation about nationalizing the railroads because we have a nationalized highway system. <laughs> it's like, it's not too far to get from nationalized highway to nationalized railroads. Um, and, uh, you know, but, you know, when they're like in like a million different unions and don't have a single voice, you know, they aren't going to be able to advance that uh, that political view in Washington or in in state legislatures, you know. So fortunately, I mean, that's like what the whole idea of what Railroad Workers United is about is like, is like we should be in one union, you know, like 100,000 people isn't even that big of a union in the U.S., you know, the CWA that I used to work for is 400,000, you know, the teachers have 3 million, you know, um, and so, um, uh, so that's, that's kind of like, yeah, when we look at you know, why our supply chains are kind of so fucked. Like, yeah, you know, like railroad workers being in a million different unions and then, you know, Jimmy Hoffa Jr. running the Teamsters for, you know, a quarter century, you know, has a big reason to do with that. And thankfully now we have this really fantastic new leader of the Teamsters, you know, who really seems like he's trying to move things in a different direction, but it's, you know, it's like moving a barge, right? You know, um, it's going to take time before these ideas get into the discourse. But I don't see, I mean, yeah, I think, you know, getting the braking technology is critically important. You know, don't get me wrong. I mean, getting rail workers a better shake is critically important. But I think, you know, I think we absolutely need to be talking about nationalizing the rail in a more system in a more systematic way. It's, in my view, equally as important as Medicare for all because the entire economy rests on it and it's been hollowed out by decades and decades and decades of profiteering that the only way that I think we're going to be able to address the problems and frankly also the massive climate impact of the industry in the time frame that we need to is through nationalization. Well, let's also talk about that that profiteering. <laughs> yeah. As you reported, you know, in lieu of upgrading their their braking technology and implementing a new safety infrastructure, which would have cost something, mm-hmm. but n- not a lot in the grand scheme of things. They were doing waves and waves of stock buybacks. This is just a common theme yeah. with so many industries, over, the, yeah. especially over the past several years. Yeah. Could you talk about the rail industry in Norfolk Southern specifically, what they were doing in terms of stock buybacks instead of investing in new brakes, investing in uh, increased or upgraded infrastructure? Yeah, you know, I mean, they did, you know, billions and billions of dollars in in stock buybacks. They spent more money on stock buybacks than they spent on all of their capital investments or improvements. That includes like basic maintenance stuff too, like over the last decade. Uh, And yeah, you know, stock buybacks is just like a company using the available cash that it has on hand. Sometimes they'll, I mean, a big thing is they'll issue debt, (laughs) To, to buy back their stock, uh, to inflate their stock value. Uh, and yeah, it's because it's what Wall Street demands. You know, they are, you know, they want ever higher valuations. They want ever higher dividends. They want ever higher uh, stock buybacks because that's what makes the big banks who, you know, control the nation's economy, you know, money. Uh, and um the CEOs are very happy to go along with it because their compensation is is tied to, you know, I mean, in some cases, 90% of their total compensation is in stock awards. Uh, so it aligns the CEO's incentives over 100% with Wall Street. And so that's what, you know, there's no difference between whatever Yahoo is running, Norfolk Southern or any major industrial concern, you know, then you know, than David Solomon at Goldman Sachs. This whole issue with uh, executives in these kind of big industries doing this kind of like stock buyback scam um, at the expense of everything else. And like, you know, at the expense of like giving, paying their workers a living wage, giving sick days, things like that. 
it's another thing that I saw Biden was railing against in the State of the Union speech. I don't. It wasn't about the rail uh, industry. It was about. I think it was about the healthcare industry. But again, it's another frustrating thing when I see uh, Democrats criticizing this and like they're describing this process and what you're describing is capitalism like like a lot of the time that these major industries they have a fiduciary uh duty to deliver the highest possible uh profits and values to their shareholders and lo and behold that's what they do that's what our system rewards um Mm -hmm. and you have democrats and liberals who simultaneously uphold this system and refuse to even attempt to reform it let alone go even further and national talk about nationalizing and things like that, but then complain about these kinds of things, which are just an inevitable consequence of the economic system that we've got, you know, it's really frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, the other thing is, you know, is, I, I mean, for all the complaints about, you know, us putting pressure on Biden or Buttigieg, I mean, I don't think he's been pressured at all. <laughs> no, And I think he, I mean, I, I often think about, you know, that, um, you know, Bill Clinton, you know, in both his campaign and right at, when he got into office, he po- proposed this like very much. Mod- it was like a $10 billion investment, primarily urban, but for everybody. But it was like $10 billion stimulus, you know. And I think the Progressive Caucus had just been started and they responded with $20 billion. And Bill Clinton went to, he said to, I'm pretty sure it was to Bernie and Maxine Waters. Maybe it was some, but I'm pretty sure they were the, he was like, what the fuck is wrong with you guys? <laughs> it's like, I need you saying like two trillion. <laughs> like, not, 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 like, like the only way we're going to even get the 10 billion is if you guys say, you know, a trillion, <laughs> you yeah. know? Um, and, uh, <laughs> You know, and it's like, and it, there's another story about Bill Clinton too. When he did the Black Hawk Down, was doing the order. It was like right before, like the blob was like sinking their cause, and him, like apparently, he said to, I think it was to Hillary and her chief of staff. He was like, "Do I really have to do this?" <laughs> and it's like, yeah, you know, it's a country that doesn't have an anti-war movement, yeah. that doesn't have a real left opposition in Congress, you know, and it's like, yeah, this is like presidents are going to do that when they're not getting any meaningful pressure whatsoever. Yeah. Whenever a president says t- starts talking like that, they show him a clip of Dealey Plaza from an alternate yeah, exactly. angle that we've never seen before. And they go, okay, never mind. Sorry, I forget I, forget I said anything. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> We're, go, let's go full steam ahead. Let's do it. You care for a joyride, <laughs> Mr. President? <laughs> Yeah. Really nice book depository. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dallas, go ahead, you. do a little tour. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for listening to this sample of the Insurgents podcast. To hear the rest of this episode and for more bonus content, please subscribe at theinsurgents.substack.com.